Welcome back to the Four Wheel Drive Podcast, driven by Shelter. Music by the Southern River Band, Let It Ride to Lead Us In. The Four Wheel Drive Podcast on Instagram and all our episodes over on Backchat's YouTube channel. We're back for our second day uh, at the Sydney Four Wheel Drive Show, Ronnie. Um, yeah, mate. Pretty exciting. We've got, we've got a few more people in for the live crowd, which is great as well. So thanks for being here, guys. Um, we want to introduce our guest. We've got Tony from GME, mate. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, Tony, how, how you been going, mate? How you been keeping? Pretty busy today. Uh, yeah, actually, busy over the last couple of weeks. Lots of open days, lots of shows. It's um, it's good to see the industry pumping. Yeah, you'd be doing a lot of shows, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah across really full like, yeah. drive and <laughs> agriculture and uh, covering a lot of Ks, but yeah, love it. Yeah, so you're based out or are you based out of Sydney, Tony? Uh, I live on the central coast of New South Wales, oh, so I'm yep. about an hour north of here, uh, but GME's head office is in Winston Hills, so uh, yep. about 20 minutes from here. So yeah, doing the commute every now and then. Yeah, beautiful. And um, mate, what's your what's your background, your experience? Um, how'd you get into where you are now? Uh, so I've been at GME for nearly eight years now. Uh, I'm the marketing manager there. I actually started at GME as the marine product manager. Um, I'm a diehard fisho, so I've fished right. my whole life, and yep. and that's what I do for fun. I didn't uh, know that. I didn't actually. I only bought my first four wheel drive a couple of months before I started at GME, and it was to tow a boat. So I had no yeah, right. interest in wheeling. I'd never done any off-road driving at all. And then I bought a D22 Navara and one of my mates said, oh, well, now you got a four, but you got to come wheeling with us. <laughs> and I went up to Lithgow. Ronnie, you'd know what's what's going on up at Lithgow. Well, that's pretty, pretty crazy. Right? Is that mild, what you for the first time? Mild to wild. And yeah, we did the power lines track in a pretty stock D22 Navara <laughs> and that was... That was it for me. The bug bit, and it bit pretty hard. Oh, mate. Uh, That's a ring of fire, getting thrown straight into that one. Yeah, man. It was hardcore. Um, <laughs> so, I had that car for a bit, and then we we found its limits pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I moved that on and bought an 80 series, and... Um, now, man, it's... Yeah, it's, it's a huge part of my life. So, your, your 80 is the GME... Car? Is that the yeah, one that's right. The, yeah, the yeah. white 80 with the old school graphics yeah, on it. That so is, that um, is a riff of that I've thing. had that for about six years now. Um, and yeah, she's she's my darling. I love yeah. that thing, man. Love tell, it. Tell us about the GQ that's parked next to it. That looks pretty wild too. So there's this perception out there that I'm a diehard Toyota fan. I don't care about the brand of car. I just like <laughs> cool cars. I'll drive anything if it's cool. Don't tell Ronnie. When I bought my 80, <laughs> I was actually looking at GU Patrols. And I ended up buying the 80, and it's set up as a tourer. So it's a capable car. It's twin locked. It's on 35. It's got all the bar work, but it's heavy because it's got all the gear in it. And as we're pushing the limits and driving harder and harder tracks, I'm just breaking a lot of things. So we decided to go with a GQ coil cab. I wanted something lightweight. I wanted something bulletproof. Uh, So we built that last year just to drive all the hardest tracks we can find. Yeah, right. That's uh, unreal. Mate, a throw-around car. I need one of those. <laughs> oh, mate, do you? <laughs> yeah. you got no room for them. Mate, too expensive yeah. to throw on these ones around, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I treat the GQ like a hire car. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's it's amazing how capable a car is when you're not fussed about, you know, bending it or scratching it. Yeah. Whereas my 80, I, I, I'm told by my wife constantly That's, to look after yeah, it. Yeah, fair enough. And what, what's your um, what's your favourite type of camping, then? Like, are you, Have you got a preference coast, bush, desert? I absolutely love the outback. Yeah. So it's you know it's a bit ironic saying I love fishing, but I also love the outback. But I live on the coast, so we spend a lot of time at yeah, the beach and, and fishing. But if I could choose where to go, I would go straight back to the Simpson Desert. Yeah. I absolutely love it out there, man. Yeah, right. Eh? I'm just testing how keen you are fishing. Do you bring a fishing rod to the outback? <laughs> I haven't, but that's not to say that you couldn't do it because the last time I was out there, it was pretty wet. Fair enough. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard there's been some, uh, yeah, some inland seas uh, out in Simpson uh, yeah. last season. Yes, um, which there is interesting. Has. <laughs> hey, um, mate, we've got you here. Obviously, we, what we do here at the uh, the Four Wheel Drive Podcast is we normally have a, a topic of conversation for for each subject, and um, obviously, mate, GME, we've got you here for comms. Um, yeah, this is pretty much where I can just leave the podcast and let you two talk about <laughs> it. But, um, yeah, mate, tell us about GME and the product and the brand and, and, um, and where you're heading. So GME is a family-owned Australian business. It's really? been That's owned awesome. by the same family for nearly 65 years, yeah, so right. we're turning 65 next year. We're the only Australian manufacturer of UHF CB radios and emergency beacons. Right. So we're super proud of the fact that we're Australian. We manufacture about 85% of our revenue comes out of our factory in Sydney. Jeez. So we're making radios, we're making beacons, we're making antennas in Sydney for the Australian market we're closer to the market than any other company and we really pride ourselves on that we've got local engineering local marketing and local support so if you buy one of our products and something goes wrong with it 
it's you're going to talk to an Australian. It's going to be repaired in Sydney, and it's going to get you back on the on the road and with effective comms as quickly as possible. Yep. That's yeah, that's I didn't realize it was Australian owned, been there that long. Well, you can't say that too loudly because as the marketing manager, it's my job to tell everyone. So uh, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm we all not know doing now, my job mate. very well. <laughs> we all know now. <laughs> We're shopping GME for so, sure. Can you tell us what GME stands for? Greenwich Marine Electronics. So the business actually started in 1959 in a backyard shed. And the founder, Ted Dunn, was repairing TV tuners. That's how the business started. <laughs> oh, that's and cool. then one of his good mates, Philip Dalhunty, owned a company called GME, and he was importing VHF marine radios from Japan because they were both mad keen sailors, so they loved their yachts. And they joined forces, started doing a lot more marine product, and then in 1981 they started uh, selling UHF radios, and we made our first Australian-made UHF in 1988. We've been doing it ever since. Oh, yeah, that is That's unreal. Pretty cool story. starting yeah, in yeah. Shed, mate. And then 100%. like a massive Australian company. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the thing that really gives me the, the drive and the passion to work there is the family have said, if we can't manufacture products in Australia, we don't want to do it. Yeah. 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 And how does the product go offshore? Is it, are you worldwide? Uh, so we do export EPIRBs around yep. the world. Um, so we sell EPIRBs into Europe, uh, Asia and the Middle East. Yep. Um, and we do export our personal locator beacons. Our UHF CB radios, though, are designed for Australian right. use. So we're quite unique in Australia being able to use 80 channels of, of UHF yeah, CB of with no licensing, free of charge. Yep. Uh, that's not common across the globe. Yeah, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, right. So what's the, um, what's the basic? So I'm coming into up to your store up there and I want the, the basic setup to, to get me by for, you know, the weekend camping trip. Um, Maybe doing some long roads across the Nullarbor, or whatever it is. What, what's the basic? What's the basic setup to get me started? So the the entry point for most people is a handheld. You know what most people know is a walkie-talkie. Yep. And they start cheap and cheerful, sub one hundred bucks for a one watt handheld, and that'll give you that close range comms up to about a kilometre okay. around the campsite. If you're spotting someone when you're four wheel driving or something like that, then then a one watt is fine. And then they go up in transmission power. So in Australia, we're capped at five watt. We can't transmit more than five watt. Right. Uh, We've got five watt handhelds, and then from there you go into a fixed mount radio or a vehicle mounted radio. The benefit there is obviously you don't have to keep recharging the batteries because yep. you're running off your, your vehicle's 12 volt system, and you've got an externally mounted antenna, which is going to give you far greater transmission distance. Yeah, okay, yeah. So there's a couple of options you guys have because I've, I've tested out the, the magnet one when I had the Hilux and I didn't um, yeah, install anything into it. So you've got that one where you put the magnet antenna on top you put it through the window and then you suction cup the the radio to the screen what's cool about that one is um if you hire a car or something and you know hire cars are the best full drive cars right so <laughs> take that to the car country you could put one of those on and then hand the steering wheel back and keep your radio yeah you know, yeah. You know what I mean? yeah that's yeah, a yeah. really good point there um I, I forgot about those ones they're actually called a plug and play and they are exactly what what you described yep. Um, they're a good sort of transition from a, a handheld to a fixed mount. And even if it's not a hire car and it's a vehicle that you own, but you might only go bushing it once a year, if you don't want to install a radio, if you don't want to drill holes in your car or you don't want to have an externally mounted antenna, you can put the plug and play in and then when you finish with your trip, you can pull it out and yep. put it back in the cupboard. Yep. So, yeah, sorry. Um, you go, yeah. With, with a radio, with your entry-based radio, compared to like an XRS, like your, your flagship radios... The base 330 um, versus the the base model. What's what what could people expect the difference to be? Because there's there's a lot of different options on the market, um, and you guys have a lot of options as well. So how would how would you educate people on, on which one to to choose there? That is a great question. Uh, it can be overwhelming. You jump on our website and it seems like there's heaps of models, and you, it's really hard to to work out which one will suit your requirements. Whenever someone comes and talks to me and says, I want a radio for my car, my first question is, what sort of car is it? If it's an older vehicle, you've generally got a little bit more flexibility in terms of mounting options. With newer vehicles, you look at a dash in, say, a 300 series, there's nowhere to put a radio. They are stuffed full of electronics. So that's where our hideaway units, which are a small box with a speaker mic or a control microphone, are quite versatile because all you have on the dash is the mic. In terms of the features from the entry level up to the top, though, it's they're all 5-watt radios, so all of our fixed mounts are 5-watters. 
But as you move up the range, you get more functionality, you get improved audio quality, you get better LCD screens, or in the case of our XRS radios, they've got organic LED screens, so they're anti-glare, really easy to see, high contrast screens. But the basic premise of a UHF is obviously communication, and the one way to communicate better is having the best audio. So as you move up the range, you're going to get far better audio performance, and that's what you're paying the money for. Yeah, okay. So where, where do you mount your radio? Uh, mine is, yeah, I'm in a Ranger, so it's on the uh, passenger side of like, we've just drilled it into the side of the, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the centre console, so yep. it's in the way a little bit for the passenger right knee. <laughs> so you the speakers on, on, on your... The speakers on, on, the on that little uh, mounted part, yeah. yeah. I'm actually, um, I'm in the market. If you know what I mean, yeah. I'm not currently running a GME. I will admit, Tony. Um, but that's it. I'm leaving. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you suck me in there, Ronnie. You've but, offended him. Um, no, I. Uh, yeah, but maybe I am in the market. Yeah, but I. Um, it's pretty old setup now, anyway. So, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. I think the the plug and play option for me would be plug and play would be. Um, I think would suit my needs probably for what you reckon? Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. I'm I just, just think I, with your roof rack, it might. You know. Yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah, what's your setup then? Well, on, on mine, yeah, well, because these 70s, we're all throwing money at, like, <laughs> roof consoles and stuff. There's always somewhere to put them. Yeah, true. Um, so, I think to go to more of, like, a common car, the Hilux I had, I put it in the glove box. Um, but because because the, uh, the the speaker was on the actual handset, on the XRS, so so it doesn't matter where, where you put the, the unit, you've got the speaker up there. Yep, yeah. yep, okay. So that's... Yep. Yeah, and that's that's probably the biggest consideration, and that's the beauty of those you know those higher end models that have that speaker microphone because the box can be tucked away, yeah. it can be up in the dash, can be under your center console. A lot of people mount them in the kick panel down on the passenger side. Yep. And then you run the cable up if you need an extension, so be it. And then you've got all your controls, your screen, and your speaker all on the handset. Yep. Um, a plug and play is good. It will it will satisfy your requirements, but keep in mind you're only running like a three inch magnetic antenna. Mm. And the taller your antenna, the better your performance is going to be, the greater your transmission distance. Okay, so what, yeah, what's the difference between the antenna heights? So height is relative to what we call gain. So without getting too technical about it, the shorter antennas are generally running 2.1 dBi gain. And then as they increase in length, the longest antenna we make, which is 2.1 meters long, <laughs> is an 8.1 dBi antenna. Right. A higher gain means you can transmit further but the downside to the higher gain is that the radiation pattern of the antenna is flatter. So if you imagine okay. a balloon and it's round, that's a 2.1 dBi radiation yep. pattern. As you put pressure on the top of the balloon, it's going to elongate, but it's going to get flatter. So if you're in a hilly or a mountainous environment, a 2.1 dBi antenna is going to perform far better than an antenna with a higher okay. gain. Yep. If you're out in the Nullarbor, though, and you put an 8.1 dBi antenna on, you're going to be able to punch a lot further. Yep. Right. So it really comes down to the sort of terrain you're going to be driving in as to what the best kind of whip is. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. And to, to further add to that from, from, from testing, the, doing all that testing that we did, um, on a highway, even if you have like the ideal highway antenna, which yep. is you know, your narrow beam, if you've got that on the bull bar and you're at the front of the convoy and you've got a big canopy and all that stuff, all that blocks the signal. So save, save like Torbs, right? Yep. He's got all that on his with the antenna on the actual bull bar, but I've got my antenna on the roof. So for instance, on the Troopy or my 79, it's only a, a 2.1. I can actually get better range Still backwards, that. Yeah. but he's got better range forwards. Um, and then in the hilly gotcha. areas, yeah. Yep. That's absolutely right. And what we've got to keep in mind with two-way communication is it's line of sight. Okay. So the yep. higher the antenna is, the better it's going to be, get better it's going to perform. Right. So if you put your antenna on your roof, it's going to perform much better than on the bull bar. And what we definitely don't recommend is mounting it on the back of a wagon. So you often see an antenna mounted behind a spare on yeah, a spare wheel I've carrier. Yep. It'll transmit okay behind you and it will transmit hopelessly in front of you. Yep. Yeah, yeah right. I can definitely, um, yeah, that, that one, because uh, Chris, Chris, my uh, ca yeah, camera yeah, guy yeah. in his Prado, that's where he's got it. And yeah, great. Yeah. Great if he's in front, but yeah. not so great if he, yeah. If that's in front right. Of and a lot of people put them on the back of the car because they don't want to have one on the bull bar because they think it's distracting or whatever. Yep. I've got two pretty large antennas on my bull bar, one for UHF and one for cellular. And to be honest, after a couple of days, you, you don't even get, notice get it. You just look past them. Yep, yep. I guess, with, yeah, so, yeah. No, go, no, go, go yeah. you go. I was so going to change a bit. There's one more benefit with the antenna on, on the bull bar, although I'd, 
because I tend to drive in the dark too much, and I use my light <laughs> bar on the roof, so I end up with like you know like uh, lightsabers in my yep. in yeah. my vision when I'm trying to sleep. You know, I'm, it's like I'm watching <laughs> yeah, Star Wars while I'm sleeping. Your, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, um, but having a, a tall antenna, you know, we we're talking about that yesterday. It's a measuring stick. So if if you yeah. know if it's relative true. to your roof height, yeah, you can see, oh, yeah, I'll make it under that tree. Yeah, yeah. All that car park for me because I'm yeah. stuck in the suburbs. <laughs> yeah, so on my 80, I know that if I've got the 6.6 dBi whips on the front and they clear, the rest of the car is going to go oh, under. Yeah, yeah. When I put the shorter antennas on, then I'm flying dark. I don't know yeah. where. But to be honest, my car doesn't fit in any car parks anyway, so that, that's not really a consideration it's a, it's for me. It's a good me. little tip for young players, yeah. actually, the measuring stick at the front of the car. Yeah. I like it. Um, mate, with the two, so you've got the two antennas on the front, obviously one cellular, one um, UHF, but... We've got a question here, which we usually do in a, in a fire pit segment, but we'll throw it in now because it, it fits in well. But um, trying to install two mounted UHFs, is that how? Is there a way to do that? Is it going to interfere? Um, I think we're. I think Jade, our producer, is asking for a mate, so it's pretty <laughs> very good. To find out. <laughs> uh, absolutely, you can do it. So in my car, I run two UHFs. Yep. The main thing that you've got to consider is to keep the antennas separated. Okay. So the further away the two antennas are, the better. Uh, we recommend a minimum of 600 mil separation between any antennas. So yep. if it's a UHF and a cellular, two UHFs, a UHF, AM, FM, you name it, keep the antennas separated and you're going to reduce the amount of interference. Right. Oh, right. The other thing is, yeah. make sure that they're not both on the same channel because if you transmit on one and the other one's on the same channel, it's going to make a <laughs> yeah, pretty awful noise yep. in your car. Yep. No, yeah. very good. There you, you go, Jaden. You find that pretty quick when you like <laughs> scan for channels and you're scanning and then like you get on the radio yourself and then you're hearing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point. So I often run that setup. So I'll have a radio scanning and then another radio on a working channel. And what I'll do is I'll actually remove the working channel from the scan memory on the radio that's scanning. So it'll scan every channel except the one that I'm transmitting on. Right. So it doesn't scream in my ear every time I press the button. Can wow. you show me how to set that up? after this podcast I sure can <laughs> how, how hard are they to set up yourself If it, we, that was another question that's come in um, is it, is it, what, are they hard to install nah they're, they're really not um, the main thing when it comes to installing them is you've got to decide whether you want it on ignition or constant power so each has its benefit constant power is great if you're in camp and you want to have your radio on if yep. you're waiting for someone to arrive or if you just want to monitor what's going on and to be honest, they draw such little current in standby that it's not going to flatten your battery for you know for for yep. days. Um, some people like them on ignition. Some people have them on uh, constant. I've got two radios. I've got one of each. One's on ignition. Yep. One's on constant. Okay. The other thing to really keep in mind, and the most important thing when you're installing a radio, is where you run your antenna cables. Mm. So we get calls all the time from people saying, "Oh, my radio's not working," or "I'm getting all this interference." You know, the the radio doesn't work. And the first question we ask is, where is the antenna cable running? Where not to run it is anywhere near any other electronic device that's running a switch mode power supply. So think about LED light bars, yep. spotlights, winch cables, all that sort of stuff. Okay. If you run that cable next to the antenna cable, the antenna will pick up the electrical interference and it will continually open the squelch on your radio and right. you will not have a good time. Yep. Okay. It's, it's a, we also found that some reverse cameras that are Bluetooth... They interfere with, um, with, with uh, the radio sometimes. That's right. And, and what you've got to remember as well is the radios that we're producing these days are so sensitive so that you get the best performance out of them. But then the downside is that they're very receptive to other interference. Yeah. So one of the other things to keep in mind is don't put your mobile phone right next to the base unit of your radio because oh, yeah. you'll find when you drive in and out of towns in regional areas, your mobile phone will boost the signal to try and pick up the next tower and the radio will hear that and ah. it will continually open the squelch. <laughs> so you'll get this squawking on your radio every time you drive in and out of a town. So yeah, keep right. your phone away from oh, the radio. Right. There you go. That's you're learning something too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I'm, I'm learning this heaps is awesome. here. <laughs> so, uh, and I've also, like, speaking of learning, I learned the hard way. So I've, because I've often installed my own radios. Yep. Um, well, I've actually installed most of my own radios. I started by putting them next to power cables and then, uh, you know, like next to light bars. That was that was something I didn't know about once. Um, so now I've got the cleanest run you could possibly get because yep. it's on the roof. So actually right now I've probably got the best the the best line of sight right now with the roof open. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. probably a, another good one that we chatted about yesterday, Ronnie, was... Um, you know, when you're running the cable about connectors. Yeah. So a lot of people will cut cables and add connectors and they want to run antenna splitters so they can run two antennas. Every time you add a connector into a cable run, you lose about one dB of gain. So you can go put the biggest 
antenna on your car to get the most gain and then if you add two or three connectors into your cable run you're going to lose any benefit that you you will achieve by running that taller antenna so yeah. clean cable runs keep them away from everything else and and you know you'll get the best performance that uh, you can and yes. if you're cutting and joining too that that does that a exit too yeah um, it's, it's not notice, ideal yeah yeah so the the run i've got on the roof is on this side, there's no other cable apart from the antenna cable going to the roof console. There's nothing going near it, and I never get interference on that yeah, one. Yeah, right. Whereas on the 79, I've got two radios installed. One of them does run past a few things. I've got to work out what it is, but the other one doesn't, and that one's so it's crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning as well, like the, the cables that we use on our antennas are shielded, but you can only shield them to a point. Okay. Because the cable is actually part of the receiver of the antenna. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, okay, right. so does that mean if you have two antennas on a bull bar from two different radios, should you run those cables independently as well? Look, that doesn't matter so much, um, but definitely keep the antennas themselves separated okay. uh, and keep the antenna cables. Generally, what I do in, in my cars is I'll have the antenna cables running down one side of the engine bay and everything else running down the other side. Okay. Beautiful. Well, we'll step away from the um, UHF side of the touched at the start on the EPIRBs and uh, and the other things that GME offers, sat phones as well, but um, how important are they now in the industry and, and for just people that are wanting to get involved, Ronnie harps on about how important they are, um, which, which I, I'm starting to understand now, but um, can you touch on those a bit for us as well? Yeah, sure. So we manufacture two different kinds of emergency beacon. One's an EPIRB and one's a PLB. So an EPIRB is designed for a boat. Yep. And a PLB is designed for a person. Okay. Generally speaking, EPIRBs are used in the marine environment. PLBs are mostly used on land, but sometimes used in marine as well. Yep. Uh, they basically do the same thing. So they transmit a signal to an international satellite network, which then goes down to search and rescue. They're the thing that you need as an insurance policy. So it's a device that you never want to use, but if you need one, it's pretty handy to have. Yep. Yeah. So yep. I think... The, the reason they're becoming more and more important, particularly in four-wheel driving, is because people are pushing further. People are going on more remote trips. People yep. are crossing the Simpson. They, you know, they're spending time going further and further off-grid. And if something goes wrong out there, your mobile phone's not going to work. Your UHF's fantastic as long as someone's within range. And if you're in a particularly remote area and you get bitten by a snake or you blow the engine in your car or, you know, someone falls and breaks their leg, you want to be able to get rescue authorities out to you as quickly as possible and that's where those beacons come into yep. their own yeah yep. and yesterday when we were doing our talk over yeah uh, yep. when i was doing my talk over there with you tony at the man adventure stage um you mentioned that what was it two two and a half thousand people last year yeah it's about two and a half thousand people a year get rescued with the help of an emergency wow. beacon. that's incredible isn't that it? is incredible you would not yeah. have thought that that's crazy two and a half thousand people I, I would not like if i had to guess i would have said 250 you know Things go wrong real quick. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, you know, I know, Ronnie, I've seen what you did in the middle of the Simpson Desert. <laughs> I did the same thing yeah. in my 80 series and, and got it bogged up to the chassis rails. Uh, people get bitten by snakes all the time in this country. People fall off cliffs or jump off them in the case of <laughs> your mate. And, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, hi, Harry. Um, but, you know, th things go wrong and no one plans for it but having one of those devices in the glove box of your four-wheel drive is just peace of mind and it's an insurance policy and probably the most important thing about having one of those devices is it's all well and good if you know where it is and how to operate it but what happens if something happens to you mm. yeah so whoever you're traveling with make sure they know where it is what it is and how to operate it they're super simple to operate but if something goes wrong everyone in the party needs to know how to operate that device yep. yeah yeah which yeah really, really which means that not everyone has to have one yeah, in true. the convoy, yep. um, which yeah, I guess is another thing. So I've I've got one, and I take it from vehicle to vehicle. So I always stick it in my backpack um, that has my laptop, and that that just goes on the plane. It actually goes with me everywhere. Yeah, so right. when, when when we come to shelter to do the podcast, it's actually with me. In yeah, the right. <laughs> and and that's the beauty of it, right? So like a PLB, if you get out in a kayak or you go hiking or if you're a hunter you can there's such a small device you can take it wherever yeah. you go yep. and um, you know as I said it's just that peace of mind it's, it's the cheapest insurance you'll ever buy yeah yep. 100% Mate, we might um, we might get moving because uh, look it might be getting a bit hot out there for the, for the people that are here live but um, get we do a suntan a, yeah they are yeah we will be we do a, a uh, segment usually around the fire pit which is where we just get a, a questions in and we start a little fire up sort of yeah um, I've heard that crackling yeah, sound yeah, effect yeah. it's brilliant yeah <laughs> um, so imagine it now but we're we're going to um 
Mate, we're going to use you if we can, and we're going to throw to the, to the audience here if there's any questions. Um, you've obviously got your giveaway with the family pack, um, which you yeah, very generously given away. Family pack with one 5-watt handheld and two 1-watt handheld radios, which will be mailed out to um, to the best question. But if you guys have got any questions here live, um, fire away. You're in with a chance yeah, of winning, a, winning a family Tony, pack. Yeah. yeah, mate, go for it. The ferals. They're called the feral. They're a magnet encased in plastic and you clip it onto your uh, cable to stop interference. Is that works or it doesn't work? Uh, yeah, so, so that's a good question. Uh, this gentleman's asking about a, uh, a clip-on, I think it's a, I think what you're talking about is a clip-on filter for the antenna cable. Look, they, they are um, something that was quite popular many years ago they're not commonly used anymore particularly not in UHF radio some of the amateur radio operators still use those but for the devices that we sell and the antennas that we supply we make sure all of that filtering is done in the radio and that the antenna cable is shielded so you shouldn't need one of those filters on the radio assuming you've run your cable correctly can you, can you explain to me what, what that is so it's basically a clip on filter that goes on on top of the antenna cable and it will I guess the, the simplest way of describing it is it will draw out interference via that magnet. Okay. But it's not something that's commonly used, as I said, in, particularly in UHF CB. It's like the old school tech. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Yeah. Okay. Anyone got? Good question. That yeah. Did you want? Um, do you want to just run the? We'll run the mic out, and you want to, you want to give um Tony yeah, your yeah. mic, mate. So I just so we can yeah, hear Tony. it on the podcast as well. <laughs> um, I've got a question. So we have those handheld devices, the small one, right? <clears throat> and we use them mainly for bushwalks and for scouting the terrain when we split. Um, the problem I've got with them is that firstly, they are not really that, they, we can't really attach them too well to our backpacks. And secondly, I feel that they are not sturdy enough. Like I, they look fantastic, don't get me wrong, but I feel that especially with the kids running around and everything else, or even handling them to the kids, I feel like we may destroy them very quickly. Is there something that you're planning to, is there, I don't know, something smaller, something more compact that you're trying to introduce? Because especially the antenna is the thing that I'm particularly conscious of, that it may fall off, it may be snatched, something may happen to it. Yeah, look, that is that is a good question. Uh, and with handhelds, like with everything in life, really, there's always a trade-off, right? So the small ultra-compact radios aren't as sturdy as the larger radios, which are IP rated, so they're waterproof, dustproof. And we've even got radios in our range that are military standards, so they're tested for vibration and shock. So they'll take a lot more abuse than a smaller radio, but they're bigger. So that's the trade-off. Uh, it's a challenge for us to create a waterproof, dustproof and mill spec radio that's tiny because the mechanical construction of the radio needs to be done a certain way to make it that robust. Uh, the best tip I can give for handhelds is don't hold them by the antenna and definitely don't let the kids swing them around because we've seen that happen and everyone does it. As for attaching them to a backpack, um, you can buy carry cases for them. So a leather carry case which will again make the radio more robust, it'll make it a bit sturdier and it'll give you those attachment options for your backpack. Good questions. Great, Great questions. Yeah. With modern day technology, why wouldn't you interface your radio to your ordinary stereo and that in your car and interfacing it to your hands-free, etc., on the steering wheel? That'll be a great technology going forward. It'll be a game changer. You're obviously not on our mailing list, sir. On Thursday night, we announced a product to market that does exactly what you just described. So we've just launched a Bluetooth interface module that works with our XRS radios. It gives you wireless push-to-talk functionality, so you've got a steering wheel clamp with a wireless push-to-talk button, a pillar-mounted microphone, and it's also got Bluetooth audio so you can interface to your vehicle stereo, Apple AirPods, any kind of headphones, or even your Bluetooth speakers. So instead of having to wire an extension speaker into the vehicle, you can have a Bluetooth speaker somewhere to get that additional audio. And one of the best things about that technology for those that are hearing impaired is a lot of modern day hearing aids are Bluetooth equipped. So if you're running a Bluetooth hearing aid, you can pair that directly to your radio and you'll have UHF transmission going straight into your ear. So we announced the product on Thursday, it'll be available from mid-October. So great question. Thank you. Very well done. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could make any four drive product right now, what would it be? An 80 series diff that doesn't blow itself apart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, s 
I'm oh. sorry, I know that wasn't radio related, but it's a it's a topic that's very close to my heart at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got any any others? All good guys. Yeah, that was great. That was a really good round five. But we might save your winner. Um, we might get to my little uh, car sales giveaway as well. So it's a good number here, a good chance to win. We might um, we might roll through uh, roll through everyone here. We might as well. So we'll buy Tony some um, time to think about which which question yeah. was the best because those honestly, all four of those questions were cool. Yeah, it was gold. Now yeah. that one you asked over there. I was a bit worried about that because uh, I'm on a top <laughs> secret thing with that device. <laughs> um, anyway, so what, what we did yesterday was a was a car sales quiz. I'll read out um, I'll read out sort of the car that I've got here, and, and it's just nearest to pin takes home this uh, this Dometic. I think it's a 55 liter, which is um, which is massive. So thanks to Dometic and Ronnie for for sorting that out. But um, you get the cover as well with it, so it's a decent prize just for having a crack here. Um, so I'll get started. We've got a 2006 Toyota Land Cruiser GXL. Auto, 214,000 Ks on the clock. It's the old uh, 1HD FTE motor with a six-cylinder, 4.2-litre diesel. Pretty popular. The only upgrades it's got on it is a Legend X exhaust and an upgraded intercooler, So, uh, and it's black in colour. So the um, obviously a, a very popular motor that um, it still holds a bit of value. So Liam, can I enter this competition? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie was that good at it yesterday that I was like, no one else can enter this now. Um, so we might, if everyone's happy to have a crack, you're in the chance to win a fridge, so did, did you want to kick off, mate? Oh, you didn't hear it, sorry. Um, so we, we've got, so it's a, it's a 2006 Toyota Land Cruiser, GXL. It's the old 1HD FTE motor, so the six-cylinder 4.2-litre diesel. You have to guess the price. And you just got to guess the price. So it's only, it's only got an upgraded intercooler on it um, and a Legend X exhaust. So it's pretty bog stock, leather seats and all that. It's really nice, a really nice make. And if you get nearest, nearest to the pin, it's done 214,000. 76. 76. 76 grand's the first guess. 66. 66. 66. 120. 120. 96. 96. 85. 85. Just say a random number. Uh, 83. 83. Who was the lowest? Who was the lowest? Who, had, who said the lowest? 66. Mate, like, you were going home with a fridge not. and you were... It was forty nine and a half thousand grand. So it's um, okay. it's out. Like, oh, actually, yeah, it's uh, you you win that, 50. mate. But um, yeah, I might have to I might have to revisit my car sales quiz and get them a little bit more. Um, you know what? I was going to say fifty, and the only oh, yeah. reason I knew that is because I just bought one of those engines to put in my eighty uh, series, and I know how much they go, go for. So I've been studying this for many years. Yeah, no, nah, well done. Um, right, we we can wrap that up there, Tony. You're you're busy, mate. You got to get back up to your stall. Um, thanks to the live crowd. For being here today, that was awesome. Um, I got a lot out of today, mate. So um, thank you very much for coming down, and um, even Ronnie was learning stuff yeah, there. Yeah, so I'm surprised how much I learned today, Tony. So th- thanks for coming on board, mate. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been really enjoyable. So thanks for having me, guys, and thanks to the guys here in the crowd. It's um, it's always good to hear questions direct from people and, and get an understanding about how I should do my job better and make sure that you know we communicate what we're doing. Yeah, perfect. No, thank you very much, guys. So that's the Full Drive Podcast, driven by Shelter, the music by Southern River Band will see us out. Find us on Instagram at the Full Drive Podcast and all our episodes over on Backchat's YouTube. And it's all about communication. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>